Welcome. Um, thank you for your patience. My name is Anna Osier Bloomer. I am Assistant Director of Career Development here at SVA. Today we are going to have a presentation about the Fulbright uh, grant programs. There are a number of programs um, offered through Fulbright depending on your situation, um, your level of education and experience. So we have today uh, Laura Siri, who's a senior program officer at Fulbright. She's gonna take you through a lot of information. I hope you brought your notebooks and pens today. Um, and then after she does a presentation, she'll do some Q&A. You have to use uh, this funny mic that I'm using right now to ask your question. So I'll be passing this around. Please wait um, till the mic gets to you so that we can record all the questions very clearly. Um, it does not project, but it will be recording for our purposes. Um, after the Q&A with Laura, we're gonna hear from our esteemed SBA faculty, Steve DeFrank, who has um, done a Fulbright um, in the past, about two years ago, very successful Fulbright. So he's gonna talk about that experience and then you can ask him questions as well. So let's get started. Wonderful, great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I know that this is a, a busy time in the semester and so I really appreciate you all taking some time out to come learn a little bit about the, about the program. Um, we are actively recruiting more arts candidates, which is one of the reasons that I am, I am here. Um, at Fulbright, I oversee Fulbright's relationship with about 1,200 US colleges across the US, um, so the number of campuses that I get to visit is a little bit limited, um, but we are based here in New York, um, and I think that there is a really rich, untapped uh, applicant pool here, so I hope that you all will, uh, will consider this as an, as an opportunity. Um, I'm gonna do some kind of general overviews about the program. I do want this to be as informative as possible for you all. So usually I would say jump in at any point with questions, but given that we have this mic situation, I'm gonna ask you to kind of hold things till the end so that we're not going, going back and forth. But, um, but I do, if there's something that I'm saying that's really not making sense or clear, like flag me down and we'll get you the mic and we'll, and we'll work through it. Um, the Fulbright program was started about 70 years ago. Um, Senator Fulbright correctly anticipated that there was going to be a surplus in the budget from the sale of wartime materials after the Second World War. Um, Senator Fulbright himself had had a road, so he'd gone to Oxford, um, and that had been a really transformative experience to him. But he looked at, at the experience critically and said, that, that's a really wonderful program, but why are we not offering this kind of opportunity outside of the UK, right? So the Fulbright program was designed to increase mutual understanding between the people of the US and people overseas. We operate currently in 140 different countries. Um, these are fully funded grant opportunities, um, and I'm gonna talk a lot about the kind of ways that you get this funding, but at the core of the, f of the, of the program, and I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the presentation, is this idea about increasing mutual understanding. The way that we feel that we can best do that is by allowing you to tell us how you can go in an authentic way for you and engage with the people outside of the US and why the work that you're doing would benefit from an international perspective. So again, we're gonna kind of talk about the nitty gritties about how you win this award, um, but, but this mission continues to be central to the, to the, Fulbright, the Fulbright program um, and, and is a really important component of our, of our, our application. The Fulbright program is still funded annually through an appropriation from Congress. This is State Department money. It is taxpayer dollars at work. Um, if the mic wasn't on, I would tell you it's one of the few things I'm thrilled that the State Department is doing. <laughs> but live mics, we're gonna, we're gonna watch that. Um, so, but this is, this is taxpayer dollars at work, so you should take advantage of this, of this program. Um, the, uh, so the funding from, from the US side comes from Congress. We also have international partners who contribute to this program. We have 49 countries where we have what we call Fulbright commissions in country that are also putting money into the program. Sometimes those foreign governments are actually putting in more money per applicant than the US government is to bring students over or scholars over. Um, so we are really appreciative of those partnerships. And then in countries where we don't have Fulbright commissions, the Fulbright program is run out of the US embassy. So this is, these are bi-national agreements. We work on them annually with each country. So we're trying to avoid kind of a more colonialistic US approach being to say, you know, here, here other country, here are the US citizens that you need. Um, and really this is kind of a, a, a bi-national program and, and the bi-nationality of it is central um, to, the, to the program. The Institute of International Education, where I work, administers the program on behalf of the State Department to kind of take the politics out of the selection and recruitment process. Although maybe I've already not done a good job of that today. Um, 
So uh, just kind of keep this, keep this in mind. The Fulbright program operates in four different directions. We send US students and scholars abroad, and we bring foreign students and scholars to the US. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what those terms mean. Um, today I'm going to talk mainly about the US student side of the program, although we have an alum of the scholar side of the program here. Uh, the takeaway is that kind of regardless of where you are in your academic or, or artistic trajectory, probably there's a Fulbright for you. Um, but so we'll, and we can kind of talk about those. If there are questions about the scholar side of the program, we can also kind of address those. Um, so for the US student side of the program, the basic eligibility requirements are that you need to be a US citizen at the time of application, which is traditionally in October. We'll talk about the timeline of that. And that you need to have a bachelor's degree um, or in artistic disciplines, four years of relevant uh, kind of, of experience by the time the grant would start. So all of you are enrolled here. You're going to. Um, so the earliest that you can apply is the fall of your senior year, but then you can apply for the student program any time up through when you have a PhD, including when you are enrolled in doctoral research or or completing your your <laughs> dissertation. Um, as long as you don't have the PhD by the application deadline, you fall within the student category. You also don't need to be currently enrolled to apply. So I saw a lot of alums, which is, which is great. Um, there's no age limit on the Fulbright US student program as long as you fit kind of within that academic framework. Now, if you have a PhD or you are at kind of a more advanced stage in your artistic career, right, you're kind of maybe seven to 10 years out, you've got some uh, maybe solo shows under your belt, you might also want to think about the scholar program as that we know kind of an MFA or, or an MA uh, can, can fall in the kind of this middle range depending on your experience. But you certainly are eligible for the, for the US student program, although you can only apply to one or the other. So if you fall in that kind of middle category, we'll, we'll talk more about you later. Um, so graduating seniors, early career professionals, the Fulbright program has historically and continues to fund applications in the arts. We are undersubscribed in artistic disciplines. We get about 2,000 applications, I'm sorry, we get about 10,000 applications annually and just over 500 of them come from artistic disciplines, which is way lower than we would like to see. So there is some <laughs> money. Um, the other part of the Fulbright program that I think is really important to remember is that there are country specific requirements. Again, the Fulbright is kind of the umbrella grant organization, but each country gets to set its own preferences and requirements when it comes to language. If they have particular fields of study, they would like to see more uh, or less applications in, degree levels, those kinds of things. So as you are starting to think about the Fulbright process, you don't want to think about it as like, this is a grant that's just going to take me anywhere outside of the US, right? Going back to that cultural exchange notion, you want to think about making the case for a particular country that is going to make the most sense for your grant experience. Um, and think about the requirements and preferences that they, that they have. We're good so far? All right. Um, so within the student program, there are kind of two major types of awards that you can apply to. And I'm going to start by talking about the study research because there's a little bit more nuance within this, this category. Um, so study research awards traditionally break down into three different categories. <coughs> the first is independent research, which for an arts candidate can be going abroad to look at a um, look at a subject matter, certainly, but also to improve your own artistic discipline or abilities, right? So independent research project, you get traditionally eight to 10 months, um, although arts grants can be as short as six months, um, if the situation and the country agree on that, um, to kind of pursue your own independent research um, in, in whatever way you have, have conceived of that. The sec second option, and this I think is going to be most relevant for my, my applicants who are currently in an undergraduate situation, is that Fulbright offers fully funded master's degree programs abroad. Um, so Fulbright funding is for one year, but there are a number of countries, and there are a number of programs within Fulbright where you can start and complete a master's program in one year. Um, there are also a number of countries or universities who have said, you win the Fulbright, have Fulbright cover the first year of the program, and the country or the home institution abroad will cover subsequent years for a master's and sometimes even up to a PhD overseas. So does that one year have to be concurrent? The, the, the question was, does the one year have to be concurrent? And yes, it does need to be within the span of the academic year that you're applying for. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't kind of go and come back and then go and, go and come back. 
Um, and and the, the rationale behind that is that we want you to have sustained contact with the people and communities that you are going over to engage with as part of the cultural engagement mission of the, of the program. So that's kind of how that, that works. Um, so independent, re study, study, uh, independent research, graduate degree enrollment, and then the second is the third option is kind of a hybrid between the two. So you can propose an independent research project, and as part of that, you can be taking classes as a non-matriculated or degree-seeking student at a university abroad. This is particularly um, useful, I think, for, arti for artistic candidates who need studio space or a welding shop or right or the huge printers right like Fulbright is not going to fund you to buy a giant printer to like take on your carry-on um, you're going to need to find a an institution in country that is going to be able to provide you with some of those resources so we find that a number of artistic candidates will sometimes enroll in a class or classes at a university um, they're not they don't come out of it with a master's degree or any kind of advanced degree but they get to utilize the resources of the institution um, which let me tell you, if you're in this lovely bubble of resources right now, it gets harder when you are not in this lovely <laughs> bubble of resources. Um, so those are kind of the three main options that fall under the study research category. And again, we offer, um, we offer grants in all academic disciplines, including the practicing and performing arts. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how the arts disciplines differ um, from, the, from the traditional academic categories when we talk about the application components. But, the other more now than half the awards we offer are for the English Teaching Assistantship Program. This program strives to place native English speakers into classrooms abroad to help with language instruction. Um, and we accept applications from a wide variety of academic disciplines, including the practicing and performing arts. But the focus of this award is the teaching. So we see a lot of candidates who maybe have finished some kind of senior thesis or have worked on a master's thesis and say, I'm really kind of interested in, in arts education um, and in, bi in bi bilingual arts education, right? I want to go and spend a year teaching and I'm going to think about using my artistic practice with the students as they're acquiring language, right? To kind of think about that. So this is less about furthering your own artistic expression or experience and more about providing a framework for students as they, as they learn English. We operate this, country, this program in about 75 different countries currently, um, obviously not in English speaking countries. <laughs> that, that question comes up like, where's the disparity? Um, but uh, so there are a, a wide variety of, of opportunities within this, within this program as well if you're interested. And your placement in these countries can be anywhere from upper elementary school all the way through college depending on the needs of the country. So, with the study research awards, you tell us where in the country you need to go to conduct your project, right? What university, what town, what um, uh, uh, material supply. I, we had a, 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 a sculptor a couple of years ago who really wanted to go work with a certain type of clay, right? That was his, and he was like, so I need to be in this geographic region because that's where the clay is. And we were like, all right, good, good call, buddy. Um, so with study research grants, you tell us where you're going because your project depends on it, right? With the English Teaching Assistantship Program, we place you once you have been selected. So you don't have to find an affiliation, you don't have to apply, you don't have to get certified in the home country, right? Any of those kind of things. We do that placement work for you. Um, but again, it's a kind of a different angle of the grant. And for the study, re for the English Teaching Assistantship, you do need to prove that you are a good person for us to put in a classroom, that, that you have some relevant experiences. You don't have to be an education major or plan to be a teacher long term to be competitive in this program, but you do need to really think about how spending a year teaching English does fit into your, your trajectory and why you're, why you're qualified to do it, what you want to do in country, and then kind of how you anticipate that that's going to impact your future career plans. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the grant benefits, which I joke that this should be the first slide that I put up. Um, Fulbright awards are fully funded grant opportunities. So we cover your round trip airfare from the US to the host country where, where you've won the award to. There's a monthly stipend to cover your living expenses, clothes, shelter, food, transportation, all those kind of things. There's accident and sickness insurance. Um, and then depending on the type of award that you have won, there are other um, opportunities, right? So if obviously if it's the study program, there's tuition waivers that can be involved. Um, language training. Uh, each country, again, gets to set its own requirements about what le level of language they would like to see you come in with. But most countries will be really supportive if you want to continue your language study while you're there because 
Turns out cultural exchange works better if you can talk to people. <laughs> We, little, little thing we've discovered in 70 years of doing this. Um, so that, you know, the countries are, are thrilled about that. I also should put a caveat with the language that there are a number of countries that don't have any language requirements because you can either function in, in English or they understand that the language is not commonly taught here in the U.S. and so the reality that you would have um, a working knowledge of the language just doesn't kind of exist, right? Um, Research allowance, which sometimes can be for artistic materials, um, and then enrichment activities. All Fulbrighters uh, participate in an orientation either here in the U.S. before they head over or once they arrive in country. And then at various points during the year, we bring all of the Fulbrighters together, both the students and the scholars, to, to um, kind of for enrichment seminars. So you get to see a different part of the country. You get to hear about what other Fulbrighters are, are doing. It's a really great network, networking and building, and you also get to just, I, I went to the one in the UK this year and it was in Manchester, which is a city I probably would never have visited on my own, and it was lovely, um, so it was a great time. Uh, some countries will also offer a, a dependent allowance, which means if you are married or have children and those people would like to accompany you on the grant, there's some additional minimal funding for them to kind of come over with you. Um, I should say, on the scholar side of the program, there are much more robust uh, networks for bringing spouses and children, because traditionally, that's the phase of life when you have those people. But, but we understand that people come to this program at all, at all different phases, so there is a dependent allowance. Um, and then disability-related accommodations and funding uh, can be tacked onto your grant. Fulbright is very committed to sending abroad a cohort of people who are as diverse as the U.S. That is really fundamental for us to break down the notion that there is one American experience, right? Um, and so certainly we want uh, applicants with disabilities to, to feel welcome in this, in this pool, and there's additional funding for that as well. Um, the thing that I can't put on the slide and probably shouldn't say on camera <laughs> is, uh, because it's not mine to give, is that most loan companies will defer loans while you are on a Fulbright as if you are in graduate school. So I can't make you that promise because that's a relationship that you have with the loan shark, I mean company. <laughs> but um, I should say that, that we are very grateful to the loan companies that do offer deferments and that most grantees are able to work something out so that they are not having to pay back their loans while they're on the, on the grant. So um, we don't give a dollar amount for the grant because it depends on the country that you are going to. You'll he start to hear me say that. I sound like a broken record by the end of this thing. Um, you're not going to get rich on a Fulbright, but it should cover all of your day-to-day -day experiences, right? Um, we, we calculate the cost of living in the country, and you are essentially asked to live at a graduate level style of life as it as it, that's defined in the host country, right? So s some of you who are placed in more urban areas, the, the, the monetary amount might be a little bit tighter. If you're in a rural, more rural area, you're just going to feel like, you know, Donald Duck swimming in that pool of <laughs> coins. Um, Kidding, kidding, State Department, <laughs> kidding. Um, so what, what do you have to do to win one of these things is, is maybe the next, the next phase. Um, the application is broken up into several different components that I, that I want to talk about, and, and certainly if there are questions about these, we can, we can address those in the, in the end. We ask for some basic personal data. This should not be revolutionary to any of you, and you should be able to answer it pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but in the basic uh, data section, there are three short answer questions that I do kind of want to tip you off to. The first is an abstract of your statement of grant purpose, which we'll talk about in a minute. The second is a community engagement plan, right? Going back to that notion of cultural exchange, we want you to have some idea about how when you're not in the in in the workshop, right? If you're not when you're not working on your project, how are you going to take advantage of this opportunity and, and connect? Um, the community engagement does not have to be community service, right? It can be that you're teaching a painting class or that you're running a design workshop with students or creating clothing with, right? You can kind of make this your own. We want you to show up as an authentic human in this process. Um, so don't tell me you're going to like clean up the river if you've never shown any interest in cleaning up rivers ever. Like that, that doesn't make any sense, right? But the community engagement is meant for you again, to show your slice of America and kind of who you are to the community that you'll be interacting with. Um, the third short answer question is about future career plans, right, and how you anticipate this fitting in. So not revolutionary, but something, something to think about. 
the bulk of the application that you need to produce for us um, with artistic grants, and I actually don't usually start down here, but anyone who's applying in an artistic category, and remember, that's for study research opportunities only. If you're applying in the ETA category, you don't submit a portfolio of your work because it's more about your teaching qualifications, right? But if you're applying for a study research award, you submit a portfolio of your work, and I'll show you kind of what that looks like. Coming out of here, what you do in one semester for one class is probably more than what we're going to ask for in this application. <laughs> but, so you are very well prepared, I'm not worried about you all, but it is about picking and curating the work that you feel most directly relates to the project that you plan to carry out in country so that we can see that you have the artistic chops to do it, right? That is one of our first selection criteria for artists is, do you make good art, right? Art are, are you a good artist? Are you thinking about this in interesting ways? Do you have the technical ability to be able to do this? And that's where your training here is going to come in very, very, very handy. So, so you do you submit what we call supplemental materials, which is a work, a work sample or portfolio. And then the written component of the application um, is a two-page, for study research awards, it's a two-page statement of grant purpose. This is really the who, what, when, where, why of your proposal, right? What led you to this point in your kind of academic and artistic exploration. The majority of it focuses on what you want to do in country, right? What's going to take six to ten months? What's the, what's the scope of that project for you? How do you anticipate that your work is going to be different in the third month than in the first month or in the ninth month, right? So kind of building a, a, a vision for the review committee to say, this is how I'm going to use your money, right? This is how I want to kind of spend this time. Um, Fulbright is a process-oriented grant, right? We are not, you don't need to promise us that you're going to have a big solo show at the end of it and that's the thing that's going to kind of get you the award, right? We're interested in exploration and we know that in artistic creation and research, sometimes things don't go as you plan, right? So you might say, I plan to do kind of a, a show at the end of it and then you get in country and that's not feasible, that's okay with us, right? But, but we want you in the statement of grant purpose to give us a vision about what you're going to be doing there. Um, if that involves a big show, great, that's, that's lovely. But it doesn't necessarily have to and I want to kind of because uh, I think there's a, uh, some misinformation about, about there. So t two pages is not a lot of writing, but I do want to say that you have help on campus to help you with the writing. So this is something that you do want to start early because you want it to be concise writing, you want it to be to the point, you want it to be clear. Um, it is really good practice for other fellowships, funding opportunities to get something like this down on paper because um, I've talked to a lot of arts alumni who say that they use their, what they started to write for their Fulbright application as the basis for any residency program or additional funding that they've applied to since they won the Fulbright. Um, so kind of think about it both in terms of the Fulbright but also in terms of your own kind of artistic and professional development. I think this is really good. If you're applying for the English Teaching Assistantship Program, you have to cut that down to one page <laughs> um, and focus it really on your experience in, in situations that would lead you to be successful in a classroom. It doesn't, again, have to be direct teaching experience, but, um, but kind of drawing some connections for us. Um, certainly, you'll probably want to weave in how your artistic interests and teaching and education kind of meld together, what you plan to do with your classroom, how you might be uniquely situated to work with students and engage with students using your artistic background to help them engage with, with language learning, and you get a whole page to do that. So, <laughs> Again, start early because these things have to be edited well. Um, the rest of the application is kind of yours to curate, right? You are not necessarily responsible for any of these pieces, but you are responsible for picking people who can best speak to your ability to carry out the project. So it looks like this. Um, we ask for three letters of reference. If you're doing some quick math up there, you get to write three pages if you're doing study research, and then you get three letters of reference. So. These letters are very important. People, good letters of recommendation show that the person who is writing the letter of recommendation has some experience with you that's going to be relevant to the grant that you're taking on, that they have some idea about what you're going to do in country, and that they're able to kind of speak to your ability to carry out, out that project. So now is a good time to start either reconnecting with your faculty or connecting with your faculty to start to talk to them about thinking about these types of opportunities, thinking about the classes that you've taken. Um, and start these conversations informally so it's not like, hey, I need this letter in two weeks, can you do this? Thanks, bye. Um, 
but that you're kind of developing these because your faculty are also going to be tremendous resources for you as you're thinking about writing your statement of grant purpose about what is feasible for kind of a six to, to ten month time span, right, which can sometimes feel a little, a little daunting to think about the scope of that. So three letters of reference and then um, we, if the country has a language requirement, we ask that you demonstrate language proficiency in one of two ways and sometimes both depending on the country. Um, the first is a self-language assessment where you tell us how you have engaged with the language up until this point, both formally and informally. Um, and also there's a question on that form that a lot of people miss about how you plan to engage with the language between when the application is due and when your grant would start, which is almost a year between those two things, right? So even if you don't have any experience yet or, or at the time of application, you can kind of talk about how you plan to engage with the language um, in that upcoming year. Uh, the other thing is if the, the country does require a higher level of language coming in, and those are traditionally we see in kind of our French, Spanish, German speaking countries, right, where, where hypothetically you could have, had, could have had access to language instruction um, here in the U.S., then sometimes you'll also need to submit what we call a foreign language evaluation that is done by a faculty member who teaches in that language to kind of assess that what you think is an intermediate is actually an intermediate mm. and those types of things. So. Um, we ask for your transcripts, but there is no GPA requirement for the Fulbright program. What we're interested in is how well you've done in the classes that have prepared you to take on the grant experience, right? So if you're a welder and you did really poorly in an architecture class, unless you're planning to do a project that involves architecture in some way, like that's not going to throw off an application. If you're a welder and you didn't do so well in your welding classes, we might need to have a larger conversation with you about life choices. But um, so. So just, we do ask for transcripts, we want to kind of see your, your academic trajectory, the choices that you've made there, but no GPA requirement or minimum um, for, the, for the program. And then the other piece of this here, it, and again, this is only for my study research candidates, for the ETA program you're not allowed to submit this. Um, if you're planning to apply for a study research award, uh, you have to include in your application what we call a letter of affiliation which is essentially a letter of invitation from someone in the host country who is going to act as a kind of reference point or support for you while you're in country. Because we're essentially handing you this pot of money and saying, have fun. Um, there are a lot of supports in country, the embassies, the commissions, et cetera, et cetera. But this is self-directed research, right? And so we want to know that you have thought about some structures and support in country that are going to be helpful. So for some of you that might be a faculty member at a university who's doing really innovative and interesting work in your, in your discipline and you're going to go and work with them, so then that person is going to write this letter, right? Don't panic. This is the time in the presentation where everyone's like, well, I don't have anybody that I know internationally, so I'm, this is not for me, I can't do it. It sounded so good, but now it doesn't. Um, <laughs> Most people, when they are starting their applications, do not know who the letter of affiliation is going to come from. So that is part of the application process. But what you can be doing now is starting to think about who is doing innovative work in the fields that you work in, right? Where in the world is that happening? Ta begin the conversation with your faculty. Your faculty here are world renowned and they have incredible professional connections, right? The other thing is that we have this whole scholar side of the program. So we've been sending faculty to that country, we've been bringing faculty, and their names are public. There's a database, it's, called, it's on a website called ciees.org. It's the scholar side of the, of the Fulbright program. And there, so you can look at people in your discipline, even if they haven't maybe gone to the country that you're interested in, reach out to them. You can reach out to, to faculty from that country, even if they're not, again, in your discipline, to say, you know, do you have some connections at your university, right? Usually getting a letter of affiliation takes a couple of months and it takes a couple of like failed rabbit hole dives um, that you kind of go down one and it's like, nope, no, okay, all right, well, let's, let's re rethink this. And who you affiliate with might impact your statement of grant purpose, right? So you want to be kind of working on these application components in tandem and not have one thing so set that then if you can't get an affiliate to work on that particular thing, the whole project is blown, right? Um, so kind of sketching out some ideas, sketching out some areas of interest and exploration, starting to think where in the world that's happening or where in the world you could make a case for that. Um, starting to kind of go down this, this rabbit hole um, because this letter of affiliation needs to be included in the application. So I see a hand in the back, yes? Does it have to be uh, like a, it's going to be an individual, it could be like an artist or... A 
That's a, that's a great question. So the question is for the mic, um, does it have to be an organization necessarily or can it be an individual? And it depends on the country. So because this is tied very closely to the visa and visa sponsorship, each country has different requirements about who in country can write a letter of affiliation. So sometimes they do need to be affiliated with a university because you're going over on an academic visa. Some countries it can say any, you know, any NGO somebody can write a letter. Other countries will say if you can make a case that there is a kind of a master teacher who's not, who's at an institute rather than a, an, an institution, that's okay, right? So again, starting to understand the country that, or countries that you might be applying to and looking at, at the requirements for the letter of affiliation is a really important stage in this process because you don't want to get one from somebody who can't, for, for Fulbright purposes, write that, write that letter for you. Another question, yes? Can the letter The question, which is very forward thinking, is can the letter of affiliation come from one of the people who are writing your letters of reference? The, the short answer is yes. The longer, more in-depth answer is if you, probably you want to use that person to write your letter of affiliation and find another person to write your letter of recommendation so that we get to hear multiple voices. Because if we're hearing from one person twice, it's kind of double dipping, and we already know that that person is in favor of your project because they've written you the letter of affiliation. So technical answer, sure. Practical answer, not a great idea. But it's a, it's a great question. So, all right, all right. Um, so I want to walk through the, the timeline a little bit. Um, and then I, then I think I'm going to open it up for, for questions and we can kind of start. So I am here now because I want you all to start thinking about this early. Um, the application cycle for 2017 has closed. It closes in October. It's mid-October every year. Um, but Starting to develop these relationships with faculty, starting to, to fit this into your kind of life plan starts now. Um, the application will reopen in the spring. It opens at the end of March. And the national deadline is in the middle of October. So you have almost six months with an open application. But the statement of grant purpose, the personal statement, those things don't change. So this might be a really great like January project, right? To kind of say, OK, I'm going to get a draft of this in and then start to think about letters of affiliation in the, in the spring semester. Um, so you have the kind of late spring and summer to officially be working on your application, although I hope that a lot of you will start earlier than that. Um, and then when you come back in the fall, it's a pretty quick succession of deadlines that happen. Sorry about that. The first is that you'll have a campus deadline, which will be before the national deadline. Traditionally, they're kind of a month to three weeks before the national deadline. So we're, think, we're talking mid-September here. Um, where you submit your materials, including your portfolio, to, to, to your advisors here on campus, who we'll introduce in a minute. Um, and then you go through an interview process here on campus. The interview process is not designed to knock people out of the competition. It is designed to give you a fresh set of eyes and perspective um, on your entire application before it's submitted before the national deadline, right? So hopefully, and you all have been through so you're, I mean, you're, nothing in the interview is going to be as hard as some of those, I imagine. Um, but you might get some feedback, right? To say, listen, you know, six of the images, six of the ten images that you provided are on point. We don't see how those other images make sense with the project that you're putting forward, right? Or you kind of go off on this tangent in your writing that doesn't make any sense to us. Like, we need you to kind of refocus that back. So again, you are not alone in this process. There is a lot of support, both in kind of the initial writing of the application, but then also once you think you've done a good job, right, to kind of say, eh, maybe we want to tweak that a little bit, or, or, or pull out these images, let's put these, you know, these, images, these images in. So then your application is submitted to us by the national deadline in mid-October. And the first stage of review happens here in the US. Um, they start on Monday. Whew, that's my life. Um, <laughs> Arts applications are reviewed by the field of study that you have applied in, right? Um, so if you are a sculptor, your, uh, your portfolio is going to be reviewed with other sculpture candidates who are applying all over the world. Um, and so we are not making a cut about what the country wants or doesn't want. We're looking at what are your skills and ability? Have you laid out a feasible project for the time that you're going to be in country? Are you going to be a good representative of the US, right? Have you thought about that cultural exchange notion of the, of the program? Um, so they're reviewed here in the US in the fall. And then in January, you find out whether or not you've been recommended as what we call a semi-finalist. 
And what that means is that your application is being forwarded on to the host country that you've applied to for further review and selection. So final decisions about applications are made in country. So as you are starting to think about why you want to go somewhere, you do need to have a genuine interest and curiosity and write in a way that's going to be respectful of the host country that you're applying to go to because they at the end of the day are making the decisions, right? Um, we get a lot of applications, mostly in the, on the ETA program, that say, you know, I want to go to Indonesia because of their rich cultural history and natural beauty. <laughs> and it's like, well, me too, buddy. But um, so you can take out Indonesia and insert most countries there, right? That's not a strong application. Strong applications, we see this less with study research candidates because you have to make a case about why you want to go there. And so the reasons for choosing that country kind of become more evident. But it's a pitfall to, to be aware of. Um, I think this is also really good practice for writing for multiple audiences, right? You don't get to revise your essays between the US selection and the in-country selection. So you need to kind of think about writing for a general audience um, and, a, and a binational audience in, in your statements. Once a country has made their selections, those selections are reviewed and approved back in the US by a 12-person presidentially appointed board before you are notified about if you've been awarded a grant offer. Um, and each country notifies on its own timeline, which is a particular joy of my existence. Um, so some countries will notify as early as kind of early, early March, sometimes even late February. And some countries take until early June to get back to us, right? So Fulbright requires some flexibility and some maturity. Um, and that you have to demonstrate in the, in the uh, notification process as well. Most countries notify by April 15th. We've done a really big push to say, listen, given the graduate calendar in the US, April 15th is when people are making other choices. And so most countries have kind of gotten on board with that. But, but it is a binational review process and the countries have a lot of autonomy in this, in this process. So again, some kind of flexibility there. And then grants traditionally start with the academic year in the host country. So traditionally, you're hearing in kind of the, the mid to late spring. And then for countries that are on a, a calendar, the, the academic calendar we use here in the US, you're taking off kind of early September, early to mid September traditionally to kind of start your grant experience. Obviously, if you're doing the English teaching assistantship program, you're going over there when their academic calendar starts because you're teaching. So it would be good to be there. Um, but with the study research, there can be a little bit more flexibility. So um, yeah, I actually, I'm going to pause here and let's start the kind of formal Q&A, which if, if you've gotten a sense from me, formal is not my strong suit. But um, we'll start the, we'll the Q&A and, and then we can kind of, I'll jump to the website if it makes the most sense and we'll, and we'll go from there. That's great. great. So Laura, thank you. This is incredible information. Um, I think since you're so good at repeating people's questions, I think it'll be faster if oh. we just let you guys call them out and sure. if you repeat them. Yeah. Um, so we'll just do it that way instead of pa passing the mic. But before we do that, I want to just mention something I forgot earlier, which is that I am now your Fulbright advisor here um, at SVA, the primary contact. Aubrey Hayes is also um, joining us now as a Fulbright advisor. She's an MFA DSI. Um, JP Forrest has been the Fulbright advisor for many years. Um, he is still a great resource for that. Do not bombard him with emails about this right now, please. Uh, but he is a great resource on campus for this. Um, Steve DeFrank, um, who's going to speak in a little bit, is also a great resource to help you with your applications. Um, so we're new to this role. So we're just starting to learn this process. Um, we've been in contact with Laura. Um, so you'll have to kind of bear with us through the, the next year as we kind of figure out out, you know how SVA is going to become more engaged with Fulbright, but we're really excited about opening this up um, in a bigger way to all of you. So all right. let's get started with some questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, forgive me in advance for sounding like a parrot. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name Hi. Is Ida. I just have a quick question about the application um, timeline. As an SVA alumni, would, is the timeline different, or do we still um, have the benefits of using the campus? Or just applying, you know, as individuals <laughs> stay online and going, going through right. that way. That's a, that's a great question. So to summarize the question, it is if you are an alum of an institution, do you utilize the resources of the institution or do you apply as in the category that we have called at large, um, which means that you're not currently enrolled at a, at a university. Does SVA work with alums? We do. 
Um, the Office of Career Development serves alumni as well as current students. We're happy to help you with this application process. However, the only difference is that we will not be, I think, engaging um, in the system as formally, right, and submitting their applications as we would for current So you for can students. you can make that call. Institutions okay. can make the decision about if they have the capacity to work with alums. Um, if if you do apply kind of through a campus, and so this is a decision that the school will have to make, you will you'll submit by the campus deadline. You'll participate in the on-campus interview. If you win, the school gets to take credit, which is the benefit to the school of working with you on your application. So we'll be um, helping you with your yeah. application <laughs> then, yes. <laughs> that traditionally does, does it there. Um, and I would, so if you are an at-large candidate, you are certainly welcome to apply. This is a federally funded program. If you meet the requirements, you're welcome to apply as an at-large candidate. Um, but if your alma mater is willing to work with you, I would really encourage you to, to do that. At-large applicants are at no disadvantage in the competition, but we find that not enrolled students who go through their alma maters fare better in the selection process because they've gotten feedback and support, they've gone through the campus interview process. Um, so if that is an option to you, I would highly encourage you to take advantage of it. So uh, um, benefits to the institution completely aside, um, <laughs> we, are, no, we are here for you um, and, and we're here to help. We're still figuring out kind of the formal process that we're gonna go through on the back end, but um, regardless, we're here as a resource for you. Yeah, great. Um, hi, my name is Costas. Um, um, I'm a teaching artist, and here comes my question. I do both. I do my art, and I teach. Yes. So uh, uh, how does that work uh, if you're interested uh, in both programs? And then the second question, um, what if you're a dual citizen um, and you want to go to the host country, but you've never really lived in the host country? Right. Does make any yeah, absolutely. So the questions were first about being an artist and a teacher and a teaching artist and how do you <coughs> sort this all out. Um, and the second question is about dual nationality and, and if you are eligible to apply to the country where you have dual, dual citizenship. So I'm going to take the first question first. Um, for those of you who are teaching artists in the world, if you're teaching at a university level, um, and you might also want to think about the scholar side of the program and whether or not being a teaching artist at a university <laughs> overseas, that, that falls more in the scholar side of the, of the program, so if you kind of have the relevant experience for that. With the US student program, you have to choo choose, because you can't say, I want to do the study research or the ETA, whatever you put me there, right? You make the case to us. So, what, but what we find for any applicant, they ha you have to do some kind of community outreach, right? So if you decide to do a study research award, a lot of arts candidates will say, and I'm gonna offer a community arts-based class or inquiry, um, right? And that's a really amazing community engagement. And the fact that you have some teaching artist experience is only going to kind of strengthen your case, right? If you apply on the English teaching side of things, you have to make the case about teaching English. But then also, um, your, your teaching placement is traditionally 25 to 30 hours a week. So you will have some time to work on independent work while you're, while you're in country. Although I think any of us who have engaged with education know that it's laughable to think that you can do anything that involves people less than 40 hours a week. But, um, but you, you kind of find time. And so we also find that some people say, you know, I really want to focus on, my, on developing my uh, bilingual education skills. And I'm also going to have some time to kind of work on my own work. But I'll kind of carve that out. So really, you have to decide. Fulbright has a lot of options, but it doesn't have all of the options, right? So you, the, the, I think the process of applying is thinking about what it is you really want to get out of that year and framing it in a way that our review committees can, can make sense of. So, yeah. Oh, wait, dual, dual national, sorry. Um, each country sets its own requirements about whether or not it will allow dual nationals to apply. So if you have dual citizenship with a country that you're not applying to, right, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But if you have dual citizenship with the country that you want to go to, first you need to think about the case about why is this a valuable cultural exchange experience and why do I need the Fulbright to do it, right? And you should check on our website, there is an eligibility section, and we list all of the countries that say, if you are a dual national, you're not eligible to apply. <laughs> So we can look at that on the website. Laura, as a follow-up to that, can you talk about um, international students who may be here in the U.S. studying on a, yeah. on a student visa? Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Great. Yeah, you so, probably so, get that. Um, so the Fulbright U.S. student program is for U.S. citizens only, right? So you have to be a U.S. A citizen to be eligible for the program. The Fulbright program also operates on the foreign side, which is to bring people to the US. So that is a completely different recruitment and application process, and you apply through the home embassy to come to the US. 
Again, if you're already here, you're going to have to have a really good reason about why you need the Fulbright to get here. <laughs> so good luck with that. But it, but, it does, but it does work the other, right? This is a binational program, so we are also bringing in um, foreign students and scholars to the, to the US. Oh, if it, the question is if it clashes with OPT. I don't know that because I don't work on that side. And there are lots of like J1 issues about, right, you know, so, and then I'll come here. Yeah? Um, this time the presenter was taking in on Fulbright South Africa, and they had to be studying at the South African University to qualify for it. So basically, if you've got another country, you can't apply to the ACA for Fulbright. So if you are, if you are a, a South African national, and, and you want to come to the US? Or wherever, or even go to another place. Right. Because I would then comply with ACA. Right, no, unfortunately not. You would have to apply, you have to apply from the country of nationality. And because the Fulbright fund program is funded 51% by the US government, this is not, we can't, we don't, not can't, we, we don't send South Africans to France, right? Because we hope that they develop their own exchange programs, but but we don't have it. No. So you do have to apply in the country of origin, and that's either to come to the US or if you're a US citizen to leave the US. So um, I saw a hand here, yeah, and then I'll come back around. Um, I don't know if you can read the slide, but I wanted to ask about um, the Fulbright with Maxim Gorbachev. Oh. If, or are you going to cover that? Later? No, I can absolutely cover it. So the question is about one of our special programs, which is the Fulbright National Geographic Award. Um, and I don't spend as much time as maybe I should talking about it because it is our single most competitive award. Um, the, the partnership with National Geographic involves five fellows um, that, and the, the differences between kind of the traditional Fulbright study research and the National Geographic is that these projects have to have a digital storytelling component to it, which can be represented in visual mediums, but also need to have a strong written component. Um, so the, another difference with National Geographic that tends to pique some interest is that you can go to multiple countries on your National Geographic award. Um, so you can look at, we have somebody that going this year who's looking at the animals of the rain canopies of rainforests, right? So he is going to three two or three regions of the world to look at the animals in, he's a biologist, um, in those, um, in those, those locations. Um, we had someone who did a lot of data mapping. His, his stuff is really awesome and he does interactive data maps. Um, and so he again was looking at I think major metropolitan areas versus rural areas in a variety of different places. So National Geographic for the right candidate is an amazing award. I, what I, I, I sit on the selection committee, I facilitate the selection committee for National Geographic, and the thing we see time and time again is that the reviewers look at the proposal and they say, this is really great, but it's an arts project, not a National Geographic project. And uh, by that point, the arts reviews have already happened and we won't categorize your work, right? We trust you to apply in the discipline that it makes the most sense. So what we're looking for with National Geographic is a sustained pr online digital presence in a kind of storytelling medium, right? You need to show us that you already know how to engage with an online community um, over a course of time, right? Um, and that your skills lend itself. The other kind of pitfall we see in the National Geographic applications is people say, well, I want to go, I want to learn, I want National Geographic to teach me how to use a camera. We got one application question this year, and I'm sorry if that person is in the room, I don't think they are, um, that said, well, well, who from National Geographic will be accompanying me on my grant? <laughs> and I was like, no friend, like, that's nice, but no. So we are looking for people who already have kind of a very well-defined skill set that they can take on the road. You do get editorial help from National Geographic and your stuff is published on their blog, which is phenomenal. But I think for the majority of people, applying in an arts field is actually gonna be a better fit um, than the National Geographic Award. But if you're interested in it, please take a look. The, the current fellows, their blogs are up there, past fellows, biographies, that's up there. So um, do kind of, uh, certainly do due diligence with your, with your research, so but. It's a different committee and it's a different. It's a um, well, essentially, you still have to show them. And right, yeah, they have, National Geographic has slightly, because it's a special program, they have slightly different um, requirements. You have to submit a digital portfolio, right, all of those kind of, uh, those kind of things. And it is, it's a, it's a, a <laughs> segregated selection process that all, National Geographic candidates are only compared against other National Geographic candidates. Laura, so. you to ask oh yes, please. Can you, can you speak a little bit about um, 
writing um, a proposal that is sus sustainable, that you can actually go and do, and your application. Um, I, I find that with some of the people I've worked with in the past, um, what they want to do may not always sound like a good idea to someone who wants to fund a successful exchange and an artistic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there are two components of, of that. And the first um, is feasibility, right? Are you in a place to do the thing that you are articulating? And have you thought about what the day-to-day -day reality of that project is going to be? And this is where we see that sometimes people make the assumptions that day-to-day -day life in country is going to be similar to what it is here in the US, right? And that you might be able to kind of go to a store and, and buy your paint supplies and then, and then go and do your large scale murals. Um, and Fulbright wants to know where's the ladder coming from, right? <laughs> and obviously in two pages you can't say, and then on day three I'll go get a ladder. But have you thought about those kind of things, right? Have you thought about the logistical day to day realities of, do you need permits to do large scale murals in this? country? You know, are, are there certain colors that are maybe culturally loaded that you should be thinking about, right? So thinking about the kind of scope and feasibility of the project is the, is the, first, the first aspect. And I think also the duration of time, right? That we see projects that reviewers will often say, well, that can be done in three months, right? Why are we funding this person from, for six to nine or six to ten months to go and do this? That, where, where's the kind of depth and richness? On the other side of it, we see projects that are so big and that take kind of so much, would take so much time that there's no way that you're going to be able to do it in the time frame allowed. So I think that's another aspect where your faculty are going to be really instrumental in working with you and talking with you about what the scope of the project should be. The second is, do you have the qualifications to do that? So I mean the artistic qualifications. I mean, have you thought about where you're going to get access to these materials? Do you have the language capabilities to be able to negotiate and to get these things or to do, the, to do this project? Um, the other thing that you have to think about is that artistic freedom and license is different in different places in the world, right? And so Fulbright is about an exchange of ideas, but if you're going to do, uh, you're also a guest. Right? So if you want to go do some really politically charged anti-government rhetoric in Russia, that might not fly, right? So thinking about the sensitivities of, and, and <laughs> artists I think, I think have a responsibility to kind of think about where that line is. Um, but with this program, you also have to remember that you are being binationally funded to do this, to do this work. So, um, so how is a project like this going to be received in country, right? Um, we had a film applicant last year who really wanted to go and interview women about menstruation. <coughs> um, and they had great, the, their film work was beautiful, but they didn't show any cultural sensitivity to that that is just not something that is discussed. That they probably wouldn't be able to get into a room without, with women without a male relative there, right? And they didn't have the language ability to conduct interviews, right? So they're a, b they're a great filmmaker, but the reality of that, we're seeing a lot right now of, of arts proposals and other proposals that say, well, you know, I want to go teach art in a refugee camp. <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. Do you, do you know what it takes to get into a refugee camp? Right? Like, so the, the reality of the experience is something that we are really tuned into in the selection process because we want you to go and hit the ground running, right? Um, and we want you to have something that is going to be feasible and successful for you to be able to do, not something where you're going to get there and you're going to kind of be hitting these, these roadblocks that are not going to allow you to kind of undertake the work that, you've, that you wanted to do. So, yeah. If your work doesn't fit into the categories listed here, are they flexible? That the, that's a great question. So the question is about if your work doesn't fit into the categories listed, um, are we flexible? And the answer is yes to a point. So we have a list of our artistic categories online um, that you can look, look at. And I will say that Fulbright kind of has traditional artistic disciplines. And we understand that the artistic fields are moving in a lot of multidisciplinary ways, right? The <laughs> trick for us is about screening applications, that we can't have so many configurations of committees that every kind of sub-discipline is going to be, is going to be uh, responded to, right? So the categories that are listed are broad intentionally, um, and the work of an arts applicant is categorizing your work as 
appropriate within the confines of our application system, which I get that there are many. Um, so, but I hope that that's a good exper experiment um, for you also about thinking about how do I best sell this to maybe somebody who doesn't know about this thing, right? And that's another area where your faculty are going to be really instrumental, right? I, you know, I do sound installation. Am I applying in a music discipline? Am I applying in a um, in in installation art? Right. That's also where you call us, and we start to have the conversation about how applications are looked at. We, the faculty um, who come and review from from us, are in these kind of traditional quote unquote disciplines. But as you know, your faculty teach a lot of different things, right? And so. Hopefully, somebody in sculpture is going to have some, you know, some experience with maybe something that relates to to the project and what you're and what you're looking at. Um, so yes, we do. Th those margins can be blurry, but you kind of have to make the case, and you have to know who's reviewing it to kind of best um, situate your work within a discipline that they'll that they'll understand. Um, so the the question for the camera is, if you're doing a, a project, kind of how much should be about the getting there and how much should be about the end result. Um, if you are only talking about the show that you're going to mount, the an, an immediate question that's going to come up is, how are you getting there and what are you doing with the rest of your time, right? So to talk about some kind of culmination of work is absolutely fine, but to focus only on the specifics of that, when that's going to be one day or two days of your grant, the a question is going to, what are you doing for the other nine months, right? So you really need to, in your two pages, talk with us about what it is that you're going to be doing for the duration of your, of your grant. So yeah. Um, as a filmmaker, I'm just trying to figure out, other than documentary, like what I should do. Yeah. To, to like meet the qualifications. Um, and so would would like submitting for the packet, like here's all my pre-production for this fictional story that I have that relates to this region of wherever, um, and this is why I need to be there to yeah. do this. And then the months that I spend in country. Uh, would be the actual like production side of things. I'm, I'm just trying to get a feel as a yeah, filmmaker. Like that's what a great. I can do to it's a great. It's a great question. So the I, the question is, as a filmmaker or or anyone, kind of how much, what are you submitting, and and how how can you relate this to your to your art in some ways, right? Um, and so I think for film specifically, people do it in a lot of different ways. Sometimes they will kind of put all of the pre production together. Other times there's camera techniques that are being kind of pioneered, or um, filmmakers who are looking at a discipline in a particular way. Obviously, subject matters can be location specific, so people are interested in that um, approaches and pedagogy to the discipline are also different by country. So sometimes it's that you want to kind of go over and, and learn about those pedagogical approaches. So it's not that you, or artistic practices. So it's not that you necessarily have a subject matter in mind, but it's more about the kind of the doing. So people approach it from all different angles. It also might be that you are planning to do a film when you come back to the US, which is going to involve you know, a characters or a location that you feel like spending some time in and thinking about the way that that represents itself visually is going to be is going to be important. So there are kind of lots of, of approaches. So in the back, yeah. Yeah. The spring, um, is there, is, are there more countries coming? <laughs> is this a question about Cuba? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, yeah. actually, what I saw, I was, I'm interested in the Pacific. And, oh. Uh, and I saw that they, there's a specific note that says that they don't do the Palau Micronesia and the Marshall Islands, mm -hmm. so I wasn't sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's a great, it's a great question. So the, the general question is, um, does the list of countries change? And absolutely, um, it does. Whether or not um, a specific country will be added to the list for next year, we are actively working with embassies in countries, but it's about um, resources and support um, in, in country and whether or not we can offer. Also, safety is a big concern for us, right? Anywhere that there is a travel advisory or warning, it's a State Department funded program. We're not going to send you to somewhere that the State Department is saying it's not safe for you to be, right? Um, so we do, it, these are, um, Negotiated on an annual on an annual basis. If there's a major change in the country, say a coup or something, uh, we will pull or add programs depending on kind of the the State Department's level of of threat. So yes, absolutely, check back. And Micronesia is that ever going to happen? I don't know if Micronesia is ever going to is ever going to happen. It's a good question, um, but. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the scholar program is designed for people who are a little bit later on in their professional or artistic kind of in endeavors. And so those placements, um, they do kind of have the option of um, going to do independent research or teaching, but the teaching is at the university level traditionally exclusively. Um, and the scholar side of the program has more of kind of a matching or a placement component where there are universities that have held visiting artists or visiting teaching spots and you're applying for that particular grant um, rather than kind of um, designing your own project. Right? That's, the, that's the, short, the short answer. The scholar program also has um, shorter term grants, so you're not going for a full year, because we know that sometimes for faculty it's difficult to get away for an entire academic semester or a year. Um, so there are kind of varieties of, um, of shorter grant opportunities within the scholar program. Uh, no, the, the, the list differs. Um, and as we bring a country on board, traditionally we'll get the scholar program going before the student program will open in that country so that there's some support. So, yeah. Hi. So, two questions. If you received, um, say, a Fulbright in the past, but it's different, is that frowned upon? The, the question is about a previous Fulbright. There's no limit on the number of Fulbrights that you can win in your lifetime. Um, the, a preference factor is to give Fulbrights to people who have not yet had a Fulbright. Um, so so you, are welcome to, you are welcome to apply, and people certainly do get multiple Fulbrights, but we do try and spread the love a little bit. And also, is the core program part of the scholar program? The core program is part of the scholar program, yes. Question in the back. Uh, before we oh. go to the next question, I just see that some people have to head out. And so before um, everybody leaves, I just want to mention that the Career Development Office is here as a resource to help you with the application. It's something that we do as part of our daily work. Patty Romeo, the other assistant director, is here. Um, so we're, you know, we're very skilled in assisting with application and grant writing. So um, that's a great resource to, to tap into um, either one of us at any point during this process um, for any application. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Can we still get other grants? Did you get a full break in PS4 without some other grants? And two, on the National Geographic, uh, language is not a requirement. Do you talk a little bit about how some people, like the ones who went to Russia, for example, uh, put that into the application? Sure, absolutely. So the first question is, can you um, accept multiple uh, grant offers on a Fulbright? You cannot accept duplicate funding. So if Fulbright is paying for your plane ticket, you can't get another grant that's also going to pay for your plane ticket. But sometimes people will get additional smaller stipends as um, kind of companion grants that are not covering things that Fulbright, they're covering things that Fulbright aren't. Um, National Geographic, one of the tricks and the competitiveness of it is that you do need to ostensibly have the requisite language for each of the countries that you are going to or prove that your project does not demand it and you're going to be able to function otherwise. Um, so if you're applying to go to multiple countries and they have multiple different languages, you either need to have some proficiency or you need to be able to show that you're going to be able to operate without them. So yeah. Yeah. Hi. I mentioned Cuba. I know. It's the uh, a, a I cannot speak on behalf of the state. The question is about Cuba. Um, I cannot speak on behalf of the State Department. They, but um, uh, I can't imagine that we won't want to bring it on board as quickly as possible. There is a large <laughs> initiative in the U.S. to expand right. exchange. So whether or not it will be brought in uh, for the next application cycle, I don't know. Um, but I would, if I was a betting woman. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess you're talking a lot about language requirements. Is it all right if there is a language requirement to say that you intend to learn more about <laughs> um, So countries will list their language requirements in one of two ways. They will say you need to have this language level either at the time of the application or by the time your grant starts. <laughs> and certainly if you want to or include language learning while you're in country, I'm not supposed to say this, but sometimes for artists there is some flexibility about having the required language when you go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put that on the recording. Um, so one of the other ways that people will in, in, engage with taking classes is that sometimes they'll say, listen, like in the first semester I'm going to be based more at a university, I'm going to be taking language level classes, I'm going to be working in their painting studio with kind of this master painter, and then in the second half of the grant I'm going to um, 
you know, uh, conduct interviews or uh, look at street art or kind of whatever it is and then create this, this dialogue with artists that I'm meeting, right? So building language instruction into your Fulbright proposal is, is okay. Um, obviously with countries that are more competitive and we have a statistics page, which I will show you in a minute, but um, applicants who have demonstrated language ability might be, might be at, a, at an advantage, right, in the competition, but, but certainly kind of working language study into your proposal, that's part of the feasibility for us, and so it's, it's, it is encouraged if that's something that you're interested in. So, uh, yeah, and then I'll come right here. Um, what's, can, can a letter of affiliation come from an organization or a university that you work with in the past doing something potentially unrelated? The, the question is about letters of affiliation, and, and can they come from someone who you've been previously affiliated with? Yes, absolutely. So, I saw a question here. And then I'll come back there. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, are there any programs that are not the National Geographic that allow you to travel to multiple destinations? To multiple countries. So the majority of the Fulbright program, because of the cultural exchange aspect, is to one country for the duration of your grant. There are some countries um, that have kind of teamed up. So uh, Greece, Turkey. Um, Oh, there are a couple that do kind of binational grants where you're spending half of your time in one country and half of your time in the other country. There's also an EU award, so if you are looking at something from the EU perspective um, and that you need to travel to multiple EU countries to kind of look at that, you can. Um, but as a rule of thumb, one type of grant to one country for one year. It's kind of a good, yeah. Oh, so each country has a country specific page that lists the type of awards that are offered in that country. And if there are any preferences, Australia is a terrible example because <laughs> they speak English. So, um, so on, this, on this page, you're gonna find the type, A, the type of awards that they offer, right? Um, any kind of special, specialty awards that they offer. But the Open Study Research Awards, if they have any preference, about um, fields of study or about applicant levels, they're gonna put that in the, um, there's a section up here that usually says applicant profile and they all, they, they haven't listed anything so they're, they're fine. Um, so you just kind of read through this. This is where you're gonna find out about if they have language requirements, the affiliation, if there's anything that you're not eligible to do, geographic restrictions, right? So each country has its own country summary page. Um, pro tip. Don't go to the web website and read all 140 different country summaries. You'll drive yourself insane. Um, <laughs> what you want to do is start to think about where your project demands that you go, right? Where you have interest and experience, what your language experience is, and start to narrow things down. And then once you get to a list of, say, under 10, then you want to start to kind of dive into the website and start to see if they have particular specialties that they're looking for or not looking for, right? Um, Japan is very interested in Japanese-American relations. They, they want to let you study that from a lot of different angles, but they see this, they want to kind of look at that from the academic perspective, right? So again, each country has its own requirements, but this is how you find the countries. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So the question is, if there's no specific mention of arts, um, should you apply? Yes. Any country that has a study research option, right? Anywhere that you say open study research awards accepts applications in the arts. So I saw oh. Oh, one hand and then I'm going to come to you. You sure? All right. Um, You're up. You said exactly what I have in mind about this Greece, Turkey um, thing. Um, is this ongoing or is this is existing but might be <laughs> um, it's if you yeah 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 absolutely um, so under the countries you're gonna go to world region the, I'm sorry the question was about Greece Turkey and if that will relationship will, will continue um, I can't make any promises about any region of the world right safety is paramount for us um, right now we are sending researchers but not English teaching assistantships to Turkey right um, so whether or not that will change is going to depend on the next kind of a uh, couple of uh, a uh, couple of, of months, but um, but you can see you can find that award on the Europe and Eurasia, um, and then there's multi-country proposals, so you can look at the at the countries that do allow that. So, yeah, and then I'll come back. Sure. Um, so one would be if um, I see that drawing illustration is one of the new categories. 
It is a new category. Yeah. Absolutely. So we did. We added. We've expanded the arts categories this year, long overdue. Um, and drawing and illustration was is one of them because we know that that's kind of an, uh, not an emerging field; it's an established field. Um, if you go under applications, we have a whole tab that is creative and performing arts, and that lists all of the artistic fields of study and then opens it up. Traditionally, we're looking for no more than 20 images um in a in a discipline and they need to be 20 images which are related to the project that you're planning to carry out right um uh in some it's, it's as few as 10 images right so we we really want a compact work sample um, our reviewers are looking at a lot of applications so we want you to be able to very concisely demonstrate to us that you have the have the technical ability every discipline expands out and you can see what is required um, and i don't anticipate those changing very much for the next application okay. cycle and the second question Yeah. Um, just in, like, if there is a, a certain country that's more leaning towards certain applications than others, yeah. and Japan has more of like educational approach. Right. So if you could just expand on that, like Absolutely. maybe just regionally, because I know you can't go country by country. Right. So we, we do have a statistics tab, and it's broken down here by type of award, right? So you can see if you're applying for a study research tab, uh, grant, how competitive the, the program is. It is not broken up by discipline. Right? So we don't say this country has funded you know, six artists in the last six years. And the reason we don't do that is that sometimes countries are begging for arts applicants and they don't get qualified people. So they're not going to fund those. Right? So <laughs> there is, there's the blog up there that you can look and it's searchable. So you can search by discipline. You can search by country. Um, uh, but just because you don't see an arts applicant there doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply. Right? Um, we want to fund quality proposals that make country specific arguments. We're not just going to fund any artist. It's you know you got a bassoonist who applies to Taiwan and like there's no reason for them to go to Taiwan. They're not getting the grant. So so we don't break it down by discipline, but it is broken down by country um, in terms of the competitiveness of awards. Um, no shocker to anybody. Uh, well, English-speaking countries are traditionally more competitive than non-English-speaking countries. Uh, then you look at Western Western Europe and moves on from there. I should say that out of the 10,000 applications that we get, over 1,000 of them, so a tenth of the application pool, is for the UK alone. And there are 42 awards. Wow. So outside of National Geographic, um, there is one award in the UK that gets over 200 applications for one spot. So, and we break that down for you, right? So you can see in each country what the, right, so you know, what the open <laughs> award looks like versus the, the, the Western Sydney one is new, but you know, obviously if you're applying in public policy, you've got considerably better odds. Um, so don't start with the statistics page, right? Playing odds, go to Vegas. If you're applying for a Fulbright, again, you want to kind of think about where you are most qualified to go. That is the, China hadn't had an arts applicant in a really long time. He, they got a sculpting, sculpting applicant that they were thrilled about. They loved him, paraded him around, right? I mean, his work is everywhere now. I, I mean that in the best central cultural sense of the word. Um, the support for him was tremendous, right? I mean, they just, so it doesn't necessarily, what you see reflected doesn't necessarily mean based on interest, it might be just about who's, who's applying. So, yeah. Hi, so my situation's a little bit tricky. <laughs> I, have, um, I applied and oh. I'm a finalist. Yay. Um, in this country. To where? Oh, in the U.S. Germany, okay. To go to Germany. Um, it's definitely generic when I go there. My father used to work for Holocaust, and he took back a bunch of those photography projects. Yep. And I think both those get people into family research. Yeah. Um, but and, um, and then when I applied the next year, which again was for the research and study research. Right. You had applied one year. Right. So the question, the question is about Germany specifically, but about qualifications and requirements. The program, the program is dynamic, and it does change year to year. Germany is absolutely accepting arts applicants. Let me just, just yes. Yeah. So without any teaching? With, uh, I'll have to look at the website. I don't oversee that program, but 
Germany is one of our major, I mean, Germany usually funds more arts grants proportionally than a lot of other countries do. So yeah, um, but again, it is a dynamic program and this is, and I think the, the best thing about the program and the worst thing of the program is that it's dynamic, right? So you do, if you are looking at multiple years, you do need to kind of be familiar with what the country is, is saying that they, that they want. Um, so yeah, and then I'll come back. Oh, wonderful. There you go. Um, and so I guess my question is more about, so I'm trying, I feel like I could fall into potentially the scholars category or the um, student category, and I'm just wondering what the differences are. And uh, I just, I guess from her question, there is sometimes a teaching component to the scholars and sometimes not. So yeah, the scholar program, which I'll pull up their website, um, is really designed for mid to, um, I think late kind of uh, professionals. Um, and in artistic disciplines, that gets tricky, right? In, in more traditional academic disciplines, we draw the line in the sand for you and it's a PhD, right? Post PhD, if you're kind of an expert at something, you're going over through the scholar program. If you are on your way to becoming an expert in something, you go through the student program. Um, artists, we tend to say kind of five to 10 years outside of the last degree that you've gotten you are in that gray area where maybe you are eligible to apply for both, but it really is about um, thinking about which program is gonna be a better fit for you because you can't apply to both. You have to pick one or the other per application cycle. And it might be that this year you decide the student program is a better fit and in two years you decide the scholar program is a, is a better fit, right? Um, so on the scholar program, there is a, um, explore awards and programs, um, you can also look at, if you go within the core program, interest and catalog of awards. So they have a catalog of awards um, that you can search by, and we're working on this for the student program, but on the scholar side, you can search by region, you can search by country or program, right? Um, and you can also set your level. So maybe if you are in that mid-range level um, and you wanna look to see Let's say that you're, you're looking at the core program and you're not a distinguished chair, you're maybe a postdoctoral early career, right? Um, that you can do a search to see what is pulling up there. Maybe I'll just pull this whole thing. Um, right? So you can kind of look to see what is, um, and this is obviously pulling all discipline awards, awards too. So, um, if you are interested in the scholar side of the program, my colleague on the scholar side of the program, her, her name is Athena Foulet, um, and she, her, all of their contact information is on the bottom of this page or on the home page. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to them. We are actively seeking applications for the scholar program as well. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of contact information. So if you have country specific questions about, about that, um, and also kind of thinking about again, what stage in your career and, and what, I think if you start to read through the, the country's uh, descriptions or the program descriptions for the scholar program, you'll get a sense pretty quickly about if there are things that match your skill level and expertise. So, yeah. So if you are applying to do an MFA, it, you would apply through the student side of the program, um, but you don't have to be currently enrolled in your undergraduate. So you could have graduated a couple of years ago and then want to go back to be getting your master's degree. It doesn't have to be contiguous with your, with your undergraduate graduation. Does that make sense? Um, my question oh, relates a little bit to the previous question about student versus scholar. Program. Yeah. Um, you know, um, as artists, sometimes you, know, you like to think who you are, what you do, and <laughs> you work as a waiter for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you realize that, you know, okay, it's over and you want to continue with that. So, um, so should I repeat or? No, no, okay. um, So um, how does that work? I mean, I can't believe I graduated like 20 years ago. Um, so how this could fit into yeah. Absolutely. So the, the, question, the first part of the question was about the distinction between the student and the scholar program and how is that made and when is that made. And really that's your decision to make, right, about which program is going to provide you with the opportunities that are appropriate for this stage of your career, right? Um, and I would say if you have questions about that, 
call us, right? Um, and I think the scholar program, if you, if you have any questions at all, starting with the scholar program might be the better fit because I the student program is um, more encompassing of more things, right? And the scholar program does have, because if you're going over to be a teaching artist, there are more specific requirements for, for that, right? Um, so, but we certainly are here to help you kind of decide which program, but a lot of that is the, is the work of the application, is deciding what is the appropriate venue for you to make your, your case. So there isn't a kind of straight line in the sand that, you know, after 10 years, if, you, if you've, for six months, for 10 years, you've been working on your artistic material and the rest of the time you're doing something else, then you should apply here, right? We don't have that kind of, that kind of matrix. Um, but I think if you, again, are reading the descriptions of the grant offers through the scholar program, you might also get a sense about what they're, what they're looking for and how they're defining experience, um, which might be a helpful indicator. But also call us, we're here. Um, so I actually, I, I, I want to stop the questions, they're here? all really good questions, but I want to leave a little time for Steve to present so you guys can actually see a project that was funded, this was successful, more exciting part of the was awesome. Um, so uh, Laura's going to stick around, mm -hmm. um, we're just going to switch over to Steve, but a big hand for Laura. Oh, no, we should just go. Thank you. All right, so, you know, it's really interesting to hear Laura talk about how the Fulbright program actually works. So I actually went through the entire process. So I can sort of tell you what my experience was. So I went to Mexico, Mexico City, as a Fulbright scholar for 10 months. And there was a language requirement. I had to um, do a, so it was a two-part process. I went through the American side, and then I went through the Mexican side. Um, my, I had to do an, a 20 minute interview all in Spanish via Skype, which the term Adobe bricks came to mind. <laughs> um, you know, and it was, it was nerve wracking, right? But they were all very, very sweet. So, um, and very supportive. It was, it, the, my whole process was great. I mean, everybody in the Fulbright side was very helpful. So, you know, I have a love of Mexico. My husband and I were traveling for many years. I did a Fulbright, I didn't do a Fulbright there, I, well, I did later, but I did a sabbatical there. I started taking language and classes. And when I was there, one person in my class took us to a Lucha Libre mass, uh, you know, tournament. And I didn't know what that was. I saw it and I was like, holy shit, this is my life. Right? So this was the title of my proposal for the Fulbright, minus the gray on the, on the bottom. The Art of Lucha Libre and Freestyle Painting in the 21st Century. Right? So that's what, I was, that's what I was doing. The big problem I had with my proposal was, and I really recommend this, you give your proposal to everybody you can to read. You cannot be shy about getting you know, feedback or criticism. You have to hear it. I gave it to everybody I knew. And one of the things they said is, what is Lucha Libre? Right? And I was like, what? Doesn't everybody know? And you know, so I had to really define my terms. Right? So this is sort of what I did. You know? So Lucha Libre, it's a free struggle. It's Mexican wrestling. Right? So I said I had to go down to Mexico to study wrestling. Because I said it was a metaphor for painting. Right? And I said that everything that painting has, wrestling has. And I said it had, and I'll go through the categories. Right? So I said, I said that it was, a, it was a symbolic match between good and evil. Right? So th where, those are the two luchadores. Those are the two wrestlers. One of the questions that came up during my interview in Spanish, Steve, the United States, it has a huge wrestling community. Why do you need to come all the way over here to study it? You know, you're just like, gah, 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 gah. you know, and I'm like, well, it's because, you know, it's a Mexican art form and truly transformed, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, <laughs> you know, so there's two components in wrestling. You have the good guy and the bad guy. That's basically it. And then I thought, you know, that's art history, sort of Western art history. We have a battle of good and evil, right? But so then I also said, it's all an illusion. Painting is an illusion. I'm a painter. So I was like, so I'm comparing like art that I see and what I see in the ring, right? And 
I was able to, I was embedded into the world of Lucha Libre, and I'm not sure how it all happened, but I would go, and I say the word locker room, which not really quite a locker room, but there the men are, and I've never seen men primp so much in my life, but they would be holding up their hair, taking razor blades, and cutting their foreheads just ever so lightly, right? So when you go in the ring, someone <coughs> pops you in the head, you start bleeding profusely. So I thought, is that real or is it fake, right? So I was able to go in and study that, right? Then the other thing that I said is that Lucha Libre is truly, it's the second most popular sport in all of Mexico. And it is almost religious. And so uh, there was the connection, right? There are priests who actually do their sermons in masks. There are cops who do traffic. There are politicians who only wear a Lucha Libre mask. It is embedded throughout the culture, right? And I was like, I am there to watch and observe. And so, and this, this guy came in, uh, Super Barrio, came in after the 1985 earthquake. And the government was doing nothing to help people. A luchador came and embarrassed the government. And to this day, there is a luchador in Congress fighting for people and anonymous. And the government actually went after Super Barrio. And when he was unmasked, which is the most humiliating thing you can do to a, a wrestler, and he said, you think I'm the same guy? There's hundreds of me. And so they never know, right? And I thought, and obviously in art, it has a political component, right? So that was an easy connection, right? But then there were these sexual illusions that I thought were really intriguing because in Lucha Libre, you have the technical and the rudo, the good and the bad guy, but you have the exoticos, right? Those are the men and women who are gay or who are transgender, right? And I was like, holy cow, man, that's fascinating. And then, you know, in art history, we deal with that very easily. But to go to a match and watch this very transgender person getting pummeled and the crowd going wild, and then when he wins, like the gay guy wins in a masculine country, the crowd goes wild, right? So I, I was, it was a lot of fun to do that. But one of the other things I had to do, talking about an affiliation. I was affiliated with, it was like the, the folk art museum, El Museo de Arte Popular, right? So I would go, that's the building right there, and I would have to give <laughs> tours in Spanish, which again was nerve wracking. They didn't know what to do with me <laughs> at all. They had not a clue. They were like, you, and like, the director only gave me the affiliation because he's like, and again, the affiliation part is hard. It's hard. You, you work early and you send out a million emails, a million letters, and you do it over and over again. He wrote me back and he said, Steve, I love this proposal. We have nothing to do with Lucha Libre in our collection. He's like, but we do have a luchador who works here. So maybe that would be a good fit. <laughs> And I'm like, OK. I, you know, but again, I, you know, I get there, and they're like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. But I made some of the best friends of my life. And so I would go to the museum three days a week. And I would go to the library, and I would read. But here's what I really did. I talked. I talked to the librarian. I talked to the registrar. I talked to the director. I talked to the secretary. I would talk. I was just like, beep, 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 beep. And we went like this. And it was so much fun, you know? And so, but what, and what I was really also doing in the collection, I was trying to identify symbols of good and evil. Because I thought the country existed as this clash of cultures. When, when you know, this, when Spain came over, it just was a crash, and they're still fighting it to this day, right? And I wanted to see if I could see these, this, conflict in the collection? And then could I find that in the art of Lucha Libre? And then I then, I wanted to train as a luchador. <laughs> so in my proposal, I had to give methodology. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to study Lucha Libre. I'm going to go to matches every week, three days a week. 
I'm going to work at the museum three days a week. I'm going to work in my studio three days a week. But I'm also going to go to this gym, and I give the name of the gym, and I'm going to train as a luchador. Right? Cultural exchange. Exactly. <laughs> and one of my very first outings, I went to this. I, I can't even, I don't have time to tell you about it, but I went to this church where the priest was hosting the luchadors, and we were all eating and drinking and drinking and drinking. That's what luchadors do. And it's tequila with squirt. <laughs> and, and they looked at me and they're like, no. You get in that ring, we will kill you. And I'm like, what? And they're like, we will break your arm, we will break your nose, we want to see if you will come back the next day. And I'm like, I'm not coming back. But what they said is they said, take dance lessons, then come back to us. So I signed up for <laughs> salsa lessons. And, um, I, and then I could understand the whole thing. Let me just get back a little to this. I'll go through it quickly. So this was what I was doing at the museum, right? This tree of life, these, these masks. You know, the tree of life you know, has this whole thing about you know, Catholicism and good and evil in there. So I thought there were some good references. I started to fall in love. Here's the thing. You can plan to your heart's content with the Fulbright, but then you never know what's going to hit you. You have no clue when you're down there. I was looking at this, you know, this indigenous art form from the Huichol, the Chaquera, these little glass beads. This thing traveled the world, this, you know, this little VW bug that is covered in glass beads. I thought it was incredible, right? And so I fell in love with this craft work, which in sometimes when you're studying fine arts, craft is this evil word, and then you have a country that is embracing it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to work with it. And you know, this is one of the guys I worked with in the museum. You know, being able to get up close to a collection was amazing. They gave me carte blanche to go anywhere I wanted in that museum. I could just walk into the storage and ask to see work, and they would pull it out for me. It was amazing. You know? And they made fun of me constantly. <laughs> so I went to weekly matches. right? And I, I didn't know how to. You know, yes, I said I was going to weekly matches. So I was going to like the Broadway of Lucha, Lucha Libre, right, where you have the smoke, the fog, the big screen, you know, you're going out there, it's great. And that was all well and good, but Starman, he was the guy I worked with at the museum, right? That's his, that's his name, Starman. His real name is Israel, and that's his wife. And, um, and he really introduced me to something I never knew I would be introduced to, and that's street lucha. And that's, that's wrestling in the streets where they open up a community and you get invited in to go. And this is like, literally, I had to get out of, my, out of the arena and into the streets. This is a one night. And here's the thing, when you're with other Fulbrighters, very first day of orientation. We all go down to Mexico City. You know, you have a week long. And you have to do a lot of talking. A lot, right? And the first day, we're in this huge auditorium. There's over 100 full writers in this room. And the three, it's four artists. And I look at the other ones, and I'm like, we're not going to do this in Spanish. And they're like, no, it's <laughs> fine. Hola, muy buenos días. <laughs> no! <laughs> so you have to get up in front. And I had to say what my project was. And if you get a Fulbright, you are going to be doing that more times than you realize, and you have it down where you can say it in your sleep. So I said what I was doing after everybody's done. A lot of people come up to me and said, so no, what really are you doing? <laughs> and I thought, was my Spanish that bad that they didn't understand? And then what I would get a lot is, the US government's funding this? <laughs> They're like, can I taste tequila? And it, the next year, there was a guy <laughs> who was this Fulbright was tequila, you know, and, and mezcal. So it was really interesting. So I was introduced to this Lucha, Lucha Libre in the, in the streets, and it's fantastic. One component about Lucha Libre is the crowd. Without the crowd, it's not a passive crowd. It is a very active crowd. And your job as an audience member, you cannot be passive. You have to be active. And your job is to get the attention of the luchador and to make them laugh or break characters. And I'm not kidding, there was a little old lady who rushed the stage and said something in Spanish that was like, you know, 
just used a slur like, Pichi tu madre, you know, and it was just sort of like, oh, oh my God, my grandmother just talked that, you know, but that's where Mexicans get to let go, right? And what they also did is they welcomed me into their world. I mean, like, I was going to baptisms, I was going to dinners, I was, you know, so it was just fascinating. I actually started making it onto the posters. You know, I went to this thing, and, they, and all of a sudden, this is all over this one little town. I got into a cab, and I'm like, uh, that's me. Right? And that, I didn't know, but I had to get into the stage that night. And I'm like, oh, no. But it was, so here's me training as a luchador. <laughs> These are my fellow Fulbrighters, because um, I was not going to do this alone. Uh, if I was going to go down, they were going to come with me. We went out there, and it was six hours of training. And they do this three days a week. And I have so much respect for these guys and their endurance and their strength and their, just the agility to dance. Um, here's me in the ring. And this is one of the um, exoticos, uh, sexy tulipan, um, sexy tulip. And, you know, they're making fun of me. I was. I was really the butt of every joke. <laughs> I was, you know, the gringo, but they would call me El Gabacho. Um, and they would pull me up on stage. They were going to kiss me. But, you know, you have to go. I mean, and again, this night, they close the community down. People cook. They invite you into your house, and they don't charge you a damn thing. It's for the community. Anybody is welcome to do it, you know? And then they were like, this guy here, they, me, they're like, this guy, he's from New York. He's studying us. One of the questions I got in my Fulbright interview was, Steve, we, you know, we understand what you want to do, but what is it that you want to paint? Are you doing portraits? And I was like, no. I was like, well, I didn't even know if my, if my proposal, my thesis was even correct, right? So I didn't know there was an outcome to it. I just, I was there to observe. And I didn't want to do academic portraits, you know? So, you know, I, I had to rent a studio, right? My, here's the big difference between the student Fulbright and, and the scholar Fulbright. I'll just talk about a little bit of numbers. The, the majority of the students were getting 15,000 for the year, for the 10 months. I got $38,000. Wow. That was the difference, wow. right? I had no idea. And I said to one student, I'm like, oh my God, it's like we're camping. And, yeah, and when I learned, the students had like <laughs> less than half of what I was getting. I was like, oh, oh, sorry, you know. Um, so out of my chunk, I was responsible for my apartment. The Fulbright said, good luck, you know, see what you can do to find an apartment. Good luck if you can find a studio. It wasn't their concern, right? I went down months earlier, found an apartment. I got really lucky. I found a studio by an alum of SVA who had, I bumped into at an opening. And she's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, what are you doing here? And she's like, I live here. I'm like, I'm going to live here. So she helped me find this studio, which was a godsend. It was a really beautiful studio. This was the kind of work I did in this studio. Um, so this is super porque. I met a wrestler who was super porky, who was about 350 pounds, um, hot, sweaty. Like I said, these men would be in the dressing room, locker room and primping and preening, you know, so like, I didn't know this was gonna be part of my study, right? And they're fixing their leggings, they're putting their makeup on, they're cutting their foreheads, and I was like, that was really impressive to me. So I, I thought, I'm just gonna get a pair of pantyhose and I'm gonna make them hairy. And then I wanted to create an illusion, right? Because that's one panel, it's not two panels, it's one panel. What Lucha Libre does is it makes distractions. If, if I'm really loud over here doing this, and then Laura's doing something over there, who are you going to watch? The, the clown doing this or Laura doing something else? So if I could put distraction into my work, my illusion gets stronger, right? So I could start applying what I was doing. Here is super porque, porque, right? And so I wanted to match my, my sweat bubbles with his tights, you know? And all he would do is sit on people. <laughs> and the crowd loved him. They just loved him. And then I did this thing called blob in the middle. And again, I fell in love with some of the craft that I saw. So I actually went and I hired someone from a village to do chaquera. Mm -hmm. And this, poor, this guy, and you know, he, indigenous guy, he didn't speak Spanish. 
I don't speak Zapotec, right? So we had to communicate. And I said I wanted to do the chaquera. And I said, but I wanted tattoos. And he's like, I don't understand. And I know it wasn't my Spanish. But so we had to do, do this whole communication. And we had to do it over and over and over again to get it right. But eventually, you know, we did it. It broke all rules of their craft. And the biggest thing was, here I am, an American, coming into Mexico. And I didn't want to rape the culture. Right? I didn't want to go in and swoop up all the ridges like, I'm going to use this for my artwork. I wanted to respect them. I didn't want to copy Shakira. So what I decided was, that was a blob like the blobs you see in some of the, me the wrestlers, but I covered it in tattoos. Because that is actually me, right? The sailor, the traveler, the guy who goes to different places. Because that's actually what I think the role of an artist is. We observe, right? And what better opportunity than to travel, to get out of your comfort zone, and into a place that you don't really know, and then you're, you're a sponge, right? And that's what the Fulbright gave to me. It gave me this gift of 10 months. And that mo those 10 months were fun, hard. I was separated from my husband for 10 months. You know, it was not easy. You know, and it was, you know, at the time I was applying, gay marriage was not even, ex you know, was not, did, wasn't killed off. And one of my questions in the webinars, and if you are serious about applying, you do the webinar. You, do, you listen to them. Even if it doesn't apply, there's so much information in those webinars. And they post past proposals. Like, do I want to really read about like architecture and like the way they're going to redesign highways? But there's a formula in which it was written that you can identify, especially as visual people. You can see the overarching you know, structure. And you can be like, oh, this is like, I started using terms like anthropology. Like, I'm talking about my methodology about going to the gym, right? I, my methodology, you know, my, my field research was going to, you know, Lucha Libre arenas, right? So I started mimicking a language that I was reading. Because, listen, I am not academic. You know, I, I'm a painter. I use my hands. But I can identify a language, and I started using some similar language that I was seeing in a lot of these other proposals which was easy for other people. These are just some of the works I did in Mexico City. And again, I started thinking about illusion and what it meant to do illusion, right? So I tried to make my painting disappear into the background, right? Like certain things, so it was hard to tell what was real and what wasn't real. And I think that could basically sum up my life, because I'm never knowing what is real. And paint of perfection, another sort of like, where does the canvas end and where does you know, the reality begin? You know, and I love that sort of idea about that. And that's what sort of the wrestlers taught me. Um, you know, and here's sort of an exhibition. Another one that I, oh, one of the things I did do, so with this one, I, um, I went to Oaxaca and I worked with glass blowers. Like a big glass blowing tradition in Mexico. Again, I had no idea I wanted to do this, but an opportunity arose. I went down and I started speaking to glass blowers. And again, this gringo comes down and is like, yeah, I'm a painter, and I want to bring a painting down, and I want you to blow a glass blob and burn my painting. And they're like, what? So they invited me down for a week. And in the square we went, Carol, to the, yeah. And so I would take my painting down, and we would just start blowing glass, and then start burning the painting. And it's, again, I wanted to show this sort of struggle. I wanted to show a conflict of two opposing natures coming on there. And then I started doing this wall painting around it to sort of have the, the painting disappear into the wall to make the yellow part look more 3D, when the blobs of glass are actually more 3D. But people will always question, is that real? And I'm like, I don't know. And that's what Lucha Libre is. So when people ask me, is that real? I think I did a successful Fulbright. And then after every match, and I went to matches all the time. And anybody would come in from out of town, I'm bringing in Fulbrighters. Hey, Steve, I have my family, and can you take them to a Lucha Libre? Sure. You know, I would be going down. But after every match, I would go to my studio, and I would try to replicate in some manner what I saw. Right? And these are little tiny pastel drawings. This is the gift that keeps on giving. This work is influencing everything I'm doing today. And, and I'm thinking about my work really differently. 
But one last thing before I leave, one thing that I did that was a little bit different and that Mexican Fulbright, you know, the, the Comexus, they were like, what do you want to do? So I proposed, because one of the things you have to do as a Fulbrighter, you have to integrate yourself into society. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. So I made friends with people who were running galleries and they were starting an art fair called Material Art Fair. So I said, I want the artists in the Fulbright to be included in the art fair. And I wanted the State Department to pay for it. And Hazel, the head of the Comexus, was like, no. And I'm like, Hazel, come on, I'm doing it. And it was at our midterm evaluations. And they're like, you have to go to this town. And I'm like, Hazel, if we get this, this is a true example of us integrating into the me Mexican you know, contemporary art scene. And she said, OK, only if you come to this State Department breakfast. I'm like, oh, god, OK. So I, I go. And it's early in the morning, and we're sitting at this big table, and there's all these mucky mucks, and <laughs> they brought like, some of the fancy Fulbrighters. And it was like uh, an assistant to Hillary Clinton who was hosting the breakfast. Um, and we had to go around the room introducing ourselves. And we're going around, and I'm telling you, I mean, I'm not kidding. People are solving, you know, cancer. They're doing the water problems. They're going around the room. They come to me, and I just look at the assistant to the State Department, and I said, I can take you down in about three moves. And all of a sudden, so I see Hazel, the State Department, you know, she just puts her head down on the desk. <laughs> and then someone rushes up to the woman and starts whispering it, and she's like, you're funny. Tell me more. Right? And I'm like, I'm studying Mucha Libre, and I want to do it. And then I was like, I went in for my pitch, how they needed to fund. And she said, you and, and this other woman in the room, you go, you go talk. And she's like, what is the US government in for? And I said, we need $5,000. And she's like, oh my god, I thought you were going to say 50. <laughs> um, and so they gave us money to participate in this art fair. On the condition that I couldn't sell anything, because you can't make money off of your full right at the time of the full right, and that I, we include Mexican Fulbrighters who went to the United States and who are back. So we had a booth, and the, this was really funny because the State Department made us have these American flags, and we're like, what are you doing with these? <laughs> <laughs> so these are the Fulbrighters that, you know, these are you know, some of the Mexicans, and the, the four of us right here were the American Fulbrighters. And everybody had a different one. Martha was studying um, in Oaxaca, and she was studying weaving. Um, Shana was studying home altars around Oaxaca. And Maya was doing um, public art and its influence on society. And I was doing Mexican wrestling, right? So I mean, one thing I will say, like the Fulbright, and the language requirements will scare the crap out of you. But don't. They are very flexible. You know, one thing after when I was down there, and I became very friendly with the Comexus people, and I was like, boy, Hazel, that interview. She's like, Steve, we want to make sure, one, you're not crazy. We know it's stressful, and we need to see how you deal under stress, stressful situations. And she's like, because she said to me, people crack in the middle of their interviews. And then she's like, that tells us you're not ready. Right? She's like, so if you can get through, you're fine. You know, and you know, I was prepped with my Spanish teacher. Like it's going to be very formal. It's going, you know, this is the protocol it's going to be, and this is how you need to respond. And you know, the screen appears, and there are 12 members in this room in Mexico City, in this wood paneled room. And you know, each one gets up and does this very formal introduction. And I'm thinking, what am I supposed to say? So I just remember getting in front of my laptop going. Hola a todos, ¿cómo están? <laughs> and the room cracked up. And the, le the tension went down. You know, here's the thing. you got to be yourself. And it really is, you know, I did some advising with some full, you know, students here at SDA. And some of them were just trying to go to countries that didn't have language requirements. And what they were lacking was a passion for the country they wanted to go to. And, and, and that really has to come through. That, more than anything, is like, why do you want to go to that country? It's the question you've got asked the most. And then it's like, if you have this, I mean, I really thought at the end of my interview, and it was really, and this is it, I'll, I'll end right after this. At the end of my interview, they said to me in Spanish, 
we have one last question for you. And then I said, Steve, this is going to be the hardest question we're going to ask you. And again, it's like, <laughs> and they said, as you know, Lucha Libre is a, is a battle of good and evil. And there's a technical and a brutal. And you are going to be training as a wrestler. We here in Mexico want to know, what type of wrestler do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And I was like, really? And I just said, el profesor. You know, <laughs> el técnico, the good guy. And they, they, they laughed, and they said, we'll be in touch with you in a few weeks. Bye. And it just, <laughs> off. And I really thought at the end of it, I was like, did they take me seriously? You know? And, you know, because I didn't think I was intellectual enough. I didn't think my, my, my proposal was intellectual enough. And I got it. Right? And one of the things they said to me that was like, it was such an unusual proposal. Because what a lot in Mexico, they go, we want to study Frida Kahlo. We want to study Diego Rivera. Right? And they go, we get so much of that. And they said, this one was so far outside of anything we ever saw. And it was the first time that they ever had the museum, El Museo de Arte Popular, mm -hmm. as an affiliation. Oh, and I can tell you now, there's three other Fulbrighters who are going oh. to there. Right? So I opened up a door for things, right? See, these things will happen. So, you know, really go with your passion, however silly, however intellectual, however conceptual. They are open to it. They really are open to it. They don't want the same old, same old thing, right? And they will fund you. They will take risks with it. And I think that's all I have. That's it. That's it. Okay. So I think we, we have held your attention for, for yeah. so long and we appreciate <laughs> yeah. your patience. Um, we will stick around yes. if you have individual questions or things that we can be helpful with that we didn't address it. But um, we certainly hope that this has piqued some interest and we'll be seeing yes. more applications. Yeah, so I just want to say, oh, I just wanted to say next steps for, for you guys. Um, is to take all this information, read everything on the website, research everything that you can about Fulbright and what you might want to do, then come talk to us. We really want to make sure you've done your homework um, when you come in to see us. So, so just be, you know, be aware of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. research grants, you tell us where you're going because your project depends on it, right? With the English Teaching Assistantship Program, we place you once you have been selected. So you don't have to find an affiliation, you don't have to apply, you don't have to get certified in the home country, right? Any of those kind of things. We do that placement work for you. Um, but again, it's a kind of a different angle of the grant. And for the study, for the English Teaching Assistantship, you do need to prove that you are a good person for us to put in a classroom, that, that you have some relevant experiences. You don't have to be an education major or plan to be a teacher long term to be competitive in this program, but you do need to really think about how spending a year teaching English does fit into your, your trajectory and why you're, why you're qualified to do it, what you want to do in country, and then kind of how you anticipate that that's going to impact your future career plans. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the grant benefits, which I joke that this should be the first slide that I put up. Um, Fulbright awards are fully funded grant opportunities. So we cover your round trip airfare from the US to the host country where, where you've won the award to. There's a monthly stipend to cover your living expenses, clothes, shelter, food, transportation, all those kind of things. There's accident and sickness insurance. Um, and then depending on the type of award that you have won, there are other um, opportunities, right? So if obviously if it's a study program, there's tuition waivers that can be involved. Um, language training. Uh, each country, again, gets to set its own requirements about what le level of language they would like to see you come in with. But most countries will be really supportive if you want to continue your language study while you're there because turns out cultural exchange works better if you can talk to people. <laughs> We, little, little thing we've discovered in 70 years of doing this. Um, so that, you know, the countries are, are thrilled about that. I also should put a caveat with the language that there are a number of countries that don't have any language requirements because you can either function in, in English or they understand that the language is not commonly taught here in the U.S. And so the reality that you would have um, a working knowledge of the language just doesn't kind of exist, right? Um, Research allowance, which sometimes can be for artistic materials, um, and then enrichment activities. All Fulbrighters uh, participate in an orientation either here in the U.S. before they head over 
or once they arrive in country. And then at various points during the year, we bring all of the Fulbrighters together, both the students and the scholars, to, to um, kind of for enrichment seminars. So you get to see a different part of the country. You get to hear about what other Fulbrighters are, are doing. It's a really great network, networking and building, and you also get to just, I, I went to the one in the UK this year and it was in Manchester, which is a city I probably would never have visited on my own, and it was lovely, um, so it was a great time. Uh, some countries will also offer a, a dependent allowance, which means if you are married or have children and those people would like to accompany you on the grant, there's some additional minimal funding for them to kind of come over with you. Um, I should say, on the scholar side of the program, there are much more robust uh, networks for bringing spouses and children, because traditionally, that's the phase of life when you have those people. But, but we understand that people come to this program at all, at all different phases. So there is a dependent allowance. Um, and then disability-related accommodations and funding uh, can be tacked onto your grant. Fulbright is very committed to sending abroad a cohort of people who are as diverse as the US. That is really, is that we want you to have sustained contact with the people and communities that you are going over to engage with as part of the cultural engagement mission of the, of the program. So that's kind of how that, that works. Um, so independent re study, study uh, independent research, graduate degree enrollment, and then the second is the third option is kind of a hybrid between the two. So you can propose an independent research project, and as part of that, you can be taking classes as a non-matriculated or degree-seeking student at a university abroad. This is particularly um, useful, I think, for arti for artistic candidates who need studio space or a welding shop or right or the huge printers right like Fulbright is not going to fund you to buy a giant printer to like take on your carry-on um, you're going to need to find a an institution in country that is going to be able to provide you with some of those resources so we find that a number of artistic candidates will sometimes enroll in a class or classes at a university um, they're not they don't come out of it with a master's degree or any kind of advanced degree but they get to utilize the resources of the institution um, which let me tell you, if you're in this lovely bubble of resources right now, it gets harder when you are not in this lovely <laughs> bubble of resources. Um, so those are kind of the three main options that fall under the study research category. And again, we offer, um, we offer grants in all academic disciplines, including the practicing and performing arts. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how the arts disciplines differ um, from, the, from the traditional academic categories when we talk about the application components. But, the other more now than half the awards we offer are for the English Teaching Assistantship Program. This program strives to place native English speakers into classrooms abroad to help with language instruction. Um, and we accept applications from a wide variety of academic disciplines, including the practicing and performing arts. But the focus of this award is the teaching. So we see a lot of candidates who maybe have finished some kind of senior thesis or have worked on a master's thesis and say, I'm really kind of interested in, in arts education um, and in, bi in bi bilingual arts education, right? I want to go and spend a year teaching and I'm going to think about using my artistic practice with the students as they're acquiring language, right? To kind of think about that. So this is less about furthering your own artistic expression or experience and more about providing a framework for students as they, as they learn English. We operate this, country, this program in about 75 different countries currently, um, obviously not in English-speaking countries. <laughs> that, that question comes up like, where's the disparity? Um, but uh, so there are a, a wide variety of, of opportunities within this, within this program as well if you're interested. And your placement in these countries can be anywhere from upper elementary school all the way through college, depending on the needs of the country. So, with the study research awards, you tell us where in the country you need to go to conduct your project, right? What university, what town, what um, uh, uh, material supply. I, we had a, 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 a sculptor a couple of years ago who really wanted to go work with a certain type of clay, right? That was his, and he was like, so I need to be in this geographic region because that's where the clay is. And we were like, all right, good, good call, buddy. Um, <laughs> So with stuff, this mission continues to be central to the, to the, Fulbright, the Fulbright program um, and, and is a really important component of, our, of our, our application. The Fulbright program is still funded annually through an appropriation from Congress. This is State Department money. It is taxpayer dollars at work. Um, if the mic wasn't on, I would tell you it's one of the few things I'm thrilled that the State Department is doing. <laughs> but live mics, we're going we're gonna to watch that. Um, so, but this is, 
this is taxpayer dollars at work, so you should take advantage of this, of this program. Um, the, uh, so the funding from, from the US side comes from Congress. We also have international partners who contribute to this program. We have 49 countries where we have what we call Fulbright commissions in country that are also putting money into the program. Sometimes those foreign governments are actually putting in more money per applicant than the US government is to bring students over or scholars over. Um, so we are really appreciative of those partnerships. And then in countries where we don't have Fulbright commissions, the Fulbright program is run out of the US embassy. So this is, these are bi-national agreements. We work on them annually with each country. So we're trying to avoid kind of a more colonialistic US approach being to say, you know, here, here other country, here are the US citizens that you need. Um, and really this is kind of a, a, a bi-national program and, and the bi-nationality of it is central um, to, the, to the program. The Institute of International Education, where I work, administers the program on behalf of the State Department to kind of take the politics out of the selection and recruitment process. Although maybe I've already not done a good job of that today. Um, so uh, just to kind of keep this, keep this in mind, the Fulbright program operates in four different directions. We send US students and scholars abroad, and we bring foreign students and scholars to the US. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what those terms mean. Um, today I'm going to talk mainly about the U.S. student side of the program, although we have an alum of the scholar side of the program here. Uh, the takeaway is that kind of regardless of where you are in your academic or, or artistic trajectory, probably there's a Fulbright for you. Um, but so we'll, and we can kind of talk about those. If there are questions about the scholar side of the program, we can also kind of address those. Um, so for the U.S. student side of the program, the basic eligibility requirements are that you need to be a U.S. citizen at the time of application, which is traditionally in October, we'll talk about the timeline of that, and that you need to have a bachelor's degree um, or in artistic disciplines, four years of relevant uh, kind of, of experience by the time the grant would start. So all of you are enrolled here, you're gonna, um, so the earliest that you can apply is the fall of your senior year but then you can apply for the student program any time up through when you have a PhD, including when you are enrolled in doctoral research or, or completing your, your <laughs> dissertation. Um, as long as you don't have the PhD by the application deadline, you fall within the student category. You also don't need to be currently enrolled to apply. So I saw a lot of alums, which is, which is great. Um, there's no age limit on the Fulbright US student program as long as you fit kind of within that academic framework. Now, if you have a PhD or you are at kind of a more advanced stage in your artistic career, right? You're kind of maybe f seven to 10 years out. You've got some uh, maybe solo shows under your belt. You might also want to think about the scholar program as that we know kind of an MFA or, or an MA uh, can, can fall in the kind of this middle range depending on your experience. But you certainly are eligible for the, for the US student program, although you can only apply to one or the other. So if you fall in that kind of middle category, we'll, we'll talk more about you later. Um, so graduating seniors, early career professionals, the Fulbright program has historically and continues to fund applications in the arts. We are undersubscribed in artistic disciplines. We get about 2,000 applications, I'm sorry, we get about 10,000 applications annually and just over 500 of them come from artistic disciplines, which is way lower than we would like to see. So there is some <laughs> money. Um, the other part of the Fulbright program that I think is really important to remember is that there are country specific requirements. Again, the Fulbright is kind of the umbrella grant organization, but each country gets to set its own preferences and requirements when it comes to language. If they have particular fields of study they would like to see more uh, or less applications in, degree levels, those kinds of things. So as you are starting to think about the Fulbright process, you don't want to think about it as like, this is a grant that's just going to take me anywhere outside of the US, right? Going back to that cultural exchange notion, you want to think about making the case for a particular country that is going to make the most sense for your grant experience. Um, and think about the requirements and preferences that they, that they have. We're good so far? All right. Um, so within the student program, there are kind of two major types of awards that you can apply to. And I'm going to start by talking about the study research because there's a little bit more nuance within this, this category. Um, so study research awards traditionally break down into three different categories. <coughs> the first is independent research, which for an arts candidate can be going abroad to look at a um, look at a subject matter, certainly, but also to improve your own artistic discipline or abilities, right? 
So independent research project, you get traditionally eight to 10 months, um, although arts grants can be as short as six months, um, if the situation and the country agree on that, um, to kind of pursue your own independent research um, in, in whatever way you have, have conceived of that. The sec second option, and this I think is gonna be most relevant for my, my applicants who are currently in an undergraduate situation, is that Fulbright offers fully funded master's degree programs abroad. Um, so Fulbright funding is for one year, but there are a number of countries, and there are a number of programs within Fulbright where you can start and complete a master's program in one year. Um, there are also a number of countries or universities who have said, you win the Fulbright, have Fulbright cover the first year of the program, and the country or the home institution abroad will cover subsequent years for a master's and sometimes even up to a PhD overseas. So. The, the, the question was, does the one year have to be concurrent? And yes, it does need to be within the span of the academic year that you're applying for. So um, you can't kind of go and come back and then go and, go and come back. Um, and and the, the rationale behind that is Welcome. Um, thank you for your patience. My name is Anna Osier Bloomer. I am Assistant Director of Career Development here at SVA. Today we are going to have a presentation about the Fulbright uh, grant programs. There are a number of programs um, offered through Fulbright depending on your situation, um, your level of education and experience. So we have today uh, Laura Siri, who's a senior program officer at Fulbright. She's gonna take you through a lot of information. I hope you brought your notebooks and pens today. Um, and then after she does a presentation, she'll do some Q&A. You have to use uh, this funny mic that I'm using right now to ask your questions. So I'll be passing this around and please wait um, till the mic gets to you so that we can record all the questions very clearly. Um, it does not project, but it will be recording for our purposes. Um, after the Q&A with Laura, we're gonna hear from our esteemed SVA faculty, Steve DeFrank, who has um, done a Fulbright um, in the past, about two years ago, very successful Fulbright. So he's gonna talk about that experience and then you can ask him questions as well. So let's get started. Wonderful, Laura. great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I know that this is a, a busy time in the semester, and so I really appreciate you all taking some time out to come learn a little bit about the, about the program. Um, we are actively recruiting more arts candidates, which is one of the reasons that I am, I am here. Um, at Fulbright, I oversee Fulbright's relationship with about 1,200 US colleges across the US, um, so the number of campuses that I get to visit is a little bit limited, um, but we are based here in New York, um, and I think that there is a really rich, untapped uh, applicant pool here, so I hope that you all will, uh, will We'll consider this as an as an opportunity. Um, I'm going to do some kind of general overviews about the program. I do want this to be as informative as possible for you all. So usually I would say jump in at any point with questions, but given that we have this mic situation, I'm going to ask you to kind of hold things till the end so that we're not going going back and forth. But um, but I do if there's something that I'm saying that's really not making sense or clear, like flag me down and we'll get you the mic and we'll and we'll work through it. Um, the Fulbright program was started about 70 years ago. Um, Senator Fulbright correctly anticipated that there was going to be a surplus in the budget from the sale of wartime materials after the Second World War. Um, Senator Fulbright himself had had a road, so he'd gone to Oxford, um, and that had been a really transformative experience to him. But he looked at, at the experience critically and said, that, that's a really wonderful program, but why are we not offering this kind of opportunity outside of the UK, right? So the Fulbright program was designed to increase mutual understanding between the people of the US and people overseas. We operate currently in 140 different countries. Um, these are fully funded grant opportunities, um, and I'm gonna talk a lot about the kind of ways that you get this funding, but at the core of the, f of the, of the program, and I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the presentation, is this idea about increasing mutual understanding. The way that we feel that we can best do that is by allowing you to tell us how you can go in an authentic way for you and engage with the people outside of the US and why the work that you're doing would benefit from an international perspective. So again, we're gonna kind of talk about the nitty gritties about how you win this award, um, but, but 